Well, good morning. I will have a little competition outside, but <laughs> but we will focus on the Lord, right? Amen. That's what Peter. What what, uh, what was the story that we talked about? Peter, he sunk into the sea because he looked at the wind and the waves instead of keeping eyes on Jesus. We're gonna put our eyes on Jesus, and we know we'll get through it. And the Lord will lead us in that. Amen. If you will, let's turn to Matthew chapter 15. We're going to be in verses 21 to 28 today. And we're in a series on studying through the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. has been a tremendous encouragement to us because his life is amazing and his teachings are absolutely astounding and, and, and really impactful to our lives as we dive into every word that he has said. Um, Matthew chapter 15, verse 21 to 28. I'll begin reading and we'll pray and ask the Lord to help us. Verse 21. And Jesus went away from there, withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, the Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and store it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. Her daughter was healed instantly. Amen. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Our Father, again, we are thrilled to be here. We're thrilled to look through the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and examine every word he says and look into every action he took and, and to know, Lord, that there's a meaning behind everything he does. We thank you, Lord, for um, just the amazing word that you have presented before us and what we'll learn from you today. Um, help us, God, to, to really grow and to break through any strongholds in our lives, Lord, that might be stopping us from accomplishing your will as today as a result of today's message. Oh, Lord, open, open our hearts and open our eyes to see more of your truth, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We all need something to believe in. This is popular culture. This is a pop culture which we're in. Songs are written about believing. There are songs that's written by Cher. It says, do you believe in life after love? We, we want to believe in that. We want to believe in things that are impossible for us to reach, but it's good for us to believe in those things. There's a song written by Journey, Do Not Stop Believing or Believe, Do Not Stop Believing, which is the main theme of the song. A song by R. Kelly, which says, I, could, I believe I could reach the sky, I believe I could fly, I could believe all these things. And certainly, with these songs written, there's a reason why the reason why is because we all want to believe in something. We all want to have the feeling of being satisfied but we believe in. The reality is that God's created us to believe. We're created to have a sense of being satisfied, having a sense of hope, having a sense of that things will become better. But the reality is that whatever it is that we believe in begs the question if that thing can really help us. Just because we believe in love just because you believe in hope, just because you believe in some kind of human goodness, just believe, just because you believe in some kind of kindness that a part of this human interaction doesn't necessarily mean that that thing is going to be in your life. In fact, for those of us who believe in those things, we sing those songs, we believe we could fly, we believe we could touch the sky, we believe in love, we believe in goodness. The reality is that we have had broken dreams. We have had dreams dashed, ambitions crushed, life turned out to be such a way that it's become difficult for us. You see, whatever it is that we believe in, if we don't believe in God, what we believe is in ourselves. That's just what it is. Whether we believe in love, believe in goodness, believe in kindness, what you really are believing is just believing in yourself, believing in humanity. But God has designed us for, for far more than that. God's designed us to actually believe not just some kind of vague idea, some kind of hope that we can have a better life, but God actually designed for us to believe in Him. He designed for us to believe in something that has substance, someone who could truly, truly help us, someone who could truly make a difference in our lives. He made us to believe. 
He created us to believe. He created us to follow him. However, we walked our own ways. We chose our own path. And that is what we did in the garden. When Satan tempted us and said, if you ate of this fruit, then you don't need God anymore. You could believe in yourself. You could believe in your own wisdom. You could trust in your own understanding. You don't need God. We ate of it, and things haven't really turned out good for us. There's jealousy, hatred, pride, violence, and humanity as a result of following our own ways. There's oppression, war, genocide in a greater level. Humanity hasn't turned out to be good, but in fact, we have really turned out to be in a place where we shouldn't be. God, however, today is calling us back to himself. He's giving us a hope which we cannot have in and of ourselves. That hope comes through his son, Jesus Christ. You see, without God, we are deemed for that eternal judgment, eternal punishment, because God is holy and just, and we're not. But God, not only is he holy and just, he is also love. He decided to love us and care for us. That is why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to earth to die on the cross to give us his life. Jesus lived that perfect life only to give that perfect life to us. And he died on the cross to pay for the penalty of your sin and my sin so that we could be restored back to God again. This is the gospel. This is our hope. This is true hope. Not just some kind of vague hope that things will be better, but a true hope that things will be better because Jesus Christ made it available for us. We'll be forever with God, forever in that eternal kingdom. We'll be with him forever joyful, forever in love, forever without sin, forever without death, forever without tears in that place. That is our hope, that is our joy, and today God is inviting us back to that faith because in order for us to come to that, in order for us to enter into the eternal kingdom, we must first believe. And so today in this passage, God is telling us what does it mean to believe unto him. What are the characteristics of a faith that actually pleases God? We're going to see today in Matthew chapter 15, verse 21 and 28, from the example of this woman, this Syrophoenician woman, who had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. She had tremendous faith, and we can see tremendous example from her. There are four characteristics of true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that we need to look at today. Four examples of what does it mean to please God in our faith. And the first example is this. The first characteristic of faith that pleases God is a faith that clings to the mercy of God. The faith that clings to the mercy of God is a faith that pleases God. We're going to see here in verse 21 to 22. Turn with me to Matthew 15, verse 21. We'll read two verses for now. 21 and 22, it says, And Jesus went away from there, withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. So here you have a conversation between Jesus and a woman. A Syrophoenician woman who obviously is struggling with the life that she's living in. But before we get here, we're going to see how she's an example for us. We're going to, we must come to grips with what Jesus has been going through all this time in his ministry. You see, Jesus all this time in his ministry has been convincing people what the Syrophoenician woman should be doing or has been doing. But the people who he's been talking to should be doing exactly what this woman is doing right now. Namely, crying out to God for mercy and grace. Jesus himself is a savior. He's the Messiah. He's the one who came, who came and died for our, our sins. He's the one who is here presenting himself as the righteous one. He's the one who told all that the way of salvation is through the mercy of God. You cannot credit yourself with your own human goodness, your human righteousness, but you must come to God asking God for grace and mercy, and God will give it to you because God desires to love you in such a way. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6 says, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offering. God wants you to come to Him asking for grace and mercy, not presenting your good works, saying that, you know what, I deserve what you give to me. I deserve you. I deserve the, the gifts and blessings because of my good works. No, that's not the case. You don't deserve anything. God gives you good things because He loves you, because He chose you, because He cares for you. And He gives you grace. He gives you mercy. But you need to understand your position. You need to understand how lowly you are. You need to understand that every thought, not every thought, but so many times our actual thoughts are tainted with sin. And that we don't deserve God's grace. That God is holier than we ever, ever imagined. That we're more sinful than perhaps you and I know. That is why in John chapter, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 through 9, it says this. It says, if we claim to be without sin, we actually deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You say, you know what? I never sin. I don't really sin. I don't really do anything that's wrong. But Jesus laid out clearly what is the, the standard. standard is your thought. You had a lustful thought. You sin against God. You committed adultery in your heart. You had an angry thought. You have committed murder in your heart. Certainly for each one of us, we sin multiple times every day. And so therefore, we come to God with an honest heart and saying, God, I need your grace. I need your mercy as this Syrophoenician woman is doing. She's our example. However, throughout the book of Matthew, what we've been seeing is that not many people have followed this example or know of this truth. In fact, the Pharisees have prided themselves on their religious works. They pride themselves on their goodness, their doing, their righteousness, their religious traditions, and following the Sabbath, the way of praying, the way of fasting. We saw them debate with Jesus. Jesus had to call them out and say, you guys are just hypocrites. You're hypocrites who don't understand the true nature of what God is looking for. God is more holy than you ever, ever imagined. And you're more simple than you think you are. And these men are mad. They're upset at Jesus for calling out their sins. So in Matthew chapter 15, we saw uh, the Pharisees coming from Jerusalem and now really confronting Jesus. And Jesus now is walking on his path toward the cross because they're going to really clash. As a result of this, we see here in Matthew chapter 15, Jesus took a detour out of the nation of Israel. It's interesting because at this time, Jesus probably at a place where, in a place where he is in a highly, highly intense engagement with the Pharisees. And we imagine the reason why he moved out is because he knew the time for him to come go to the cross is near. His timing, his timing, when he's going to go to the cross, and he's leaving this position or the Israel for a while to wait for things to calm down for a little bit before he enters in again. And he's going to confront the Pharisees again, 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 to convince people to believe unto him. But nevertheless, he leaves this town in verse 20, or leaves the city of, or cities of Israel, leaves, leaves Galilee, and he went to this place called Tyre and Sidon in verse 21. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. He said, where is Tyre and Sidon? We heard about Tyre and Sidon back in Matthew chapter, I believe in Matthew chapter uh, 11, that in repentant cities. When Jesus actually confronted the cities of Capernaum and Chorazin by saying, hey, Tyre and Sidon will withstand less judgment than you because you refuse to believe unto me. So Jesus actually went to Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon is a place actually, in a Jewish understanding, very much a God-forsaken place. They're the place where this evil queen Jezebel came from, a place where Baal worship is brought to the nation of Israel. It's a place where people would despise the people there. That is the nation of Israel despise the people there didn't like the people there because they are the unrepentant people. They're the people who are not in the covenant of God. And there in that Tyre and Sidon region, Jesus, in verse 22, saw a woman. In verse 22, it says, Behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and met Jesus. A Canaanite. A, play, a person who is really undeserving of the grace of God. Canaanites are people who were supposed to be wiped out by the nation of Israel when the nation of Israel came to the promised land. They're the people who God says, you know what, the land belongs to you. The Canaanites are, this, are the people who are unrepentant, so therefore you should be my instrument to drive them out before you. So this person, obviously, here Matthew is recording as a person who is undeserving of the blessings of God. And not only is she undeserving of the blessings of God, she is a woman, and not that it's a bad thing, but in those days, women are considered second-class citizens. And you're not to come to a man, come to a rabbi, come to a respected teacher. She was not a respected woman like Lydia in Acts chapter 16, verse 14, where that woman was a businesswoman and she was a well-to-do woman. This is a commoner. And she came with Jesus with a problem that she cannot solve. You say, how did this woman hear about Jesus? Well, likely this woman heard about Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, verse 24, 25, when Jesus was ministering in the Galilee region, and all the people were coming to Jesus throughout all Syria. They brought him all the sick, all the afflicted, various diseases and pains, those who were oppressed by demons, having seizures, paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds were coming to Jesus, even from the region of Tyre and Sidon. So this woman obviously was not able to reach Jesus a year, year ago in Matthew chapter 4, but now a year later, when Jesus was strewed to the region of Tyre, in silence, she met Jesus and she got hold of him. Likely the Holy Spirit or someone told him that, told her that Jesus is coming and she was excited to meet Jesus she came to Jesus. And she understood where she was and she understood who she is. And she cries out Jesus in verse 22 saying, have mercy on me O Lord, son of David. She cries out to Jesus for mercy. She understood that she's a Canaanite. She understood that she is undeserving 
a woman that is deserving to talk to a rabbi, at least in that culture in those days. She understood that she's not within immediately that region where the coming of people gather. She is in this region of Tyre and Sidon. She understood all these things, and yet she embraced it. So therefore, she comes to Jesus, embracing who she is, embracing herself as a sinner before God, embracing her unworthy, undeserving status, and she cries out to Jesus and says, Have mercy on me. Of all the people that Jesus had been ministering to, the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious elites, the leaders, they did not come to Jesus asking Jesus for mercy. In fact, this is actually the first incident, if you look through the book of Matthew, look through it, not that many... Not that people didn't cry out to God for mercy and grace. I'm sure they did, but this is the first recording where an individual person actually said these words, have mercy on me, which is amazing. Here, outside the land of Israel, outside this expected place where people should come and gather before God and receive the covenant promises of God, outside of the covenant of people, there it is, a woman undeserving following exactly what Jesus told people that they should do. Cry out to God for mercy and grace. She embraced herself as a sinner. She embraced herself as undeserving. She knew that if she cried out for God for mercy and grace, she will receive mercy and grace. She approached God from a setting where she is bowing on before God, kneeling before God, bowing down and saying, God, help me. You see, this, heart, this kind of Christianity is a miss in our society because sometimes in our Christian faith and here in America we have become very self-entitled. We have. We have become a self-entitled Christian people in America. We have led the war faith movement, the entitlement, American culture that I deserve, I have rights, kind of infiltrate in our relationship with God. But the reality is that we don't deserve anything from God. See? God is more holy than we ever think. We can never imagine. He has the right to wipe us out because we're sinners before him. It's like a drive through These days, my kids and I, we go to the drive through and especially if we go somewhere really quick. And we, when we go to the drive through we talk to the, to the attendant, and we tell her, you know, we want this and that, and we pay the money, and we take the food, and we go. Sometimes we don't check what's inside, and they mess up our order at times, right? You all experience this. What do you do when that happens? Man, they're not paying attention. Like, man, this is a horrible service that we just got. I paid all this money and you didn't get my water, right? And a lot of times this is how we treat God as well. We treat God as a supermarket or a attendant, a food, fast food attendant. We treat this person, treat our God as one who would say, you know what, I paid into this. I believed in you. That's my payment. Now you got to give back to me what I want. That's what I hear all the time. You're a believer now. You ask God for a car. God's going to give you a car. You ask God for money. God will give you the money. It's your faith that controls God. That's not entirely what God presents himself to be. Entirely not what God presents himself to be here. Here in the Syrophoenician woman, she comes to God begging God for grace and mercy and says, God, it's your prerogative to give me mercy. It's your, your right whether you want to give mercy to me or not, but I will come to you and ask you for it. I will not assume anything. I will not assume from you. But I will beg and I believe that you're good toward me. You will be good because that's who you are. See, there's no sense of entitlement. Amen. From the Gentile woman. Romans chapter 11 verse 35 says, Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? Talking about God. Who has given to God that you should repay him, that he should expect, that you should expect him to repay you. No one. God has given us everything. He's given us his son, Jesus Christ. He's given us salvation. He's given us life. He's given us his eternal life. So therefore, everything we have is his. We need to come before God, knowing that the only way which we're able to survive and to exist before him is because of his grace and mercy. That's the first attitude. The first faith, the first characteristic of faith that pleases God is a faith that recognizes that it's God who gives mercy. A faith that clings to the mercy of God, but we got three more. Three more we're going to see here. The second characteristic is this. The faith that pleases God is directed at the person of Jesus Christ. The faith that pleases God is directed at the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see this in verse 22 when the woman cries out to Jesus and she says this. 
She says, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. She talks to Jesus. She said, have mercy on me. She recognized she needs mercy from God, but not only so, she recognized who she's talking to. She used the word Lord, which is what kurios. Kurios is a word that means I'm submitting to you. I'm, you're the Lord of my life. She's not referring to Jesus as a rabbi, which is a different word. She's not referring to Jesus as a teacher, which is a different word. She's not referring to Jesus as someone who's distant from her, that has no relationship with her, that she's just kind of absorbing some kind of information from. No, she's re- re- uh, approaching Jesus one who she's bound down to, that she should submit her life to. She's calling her him, calling him Lord. She's the Lord. He's the Lord of her life. So she's recognizing not only she's to submit to Jesus as Lord, but she's also recognizing him as a son of David, as the one who is the Messiah, the one who Jesus has been convincing all that he is the one sent by God, the promised one of the Old Testament, the one to save the world from its sins. First Chronicle chapter 11, verse 11 through 12 talks about who the son of David is. Speaking to David, it says, When your days are fulfilled to walk with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons. I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. Who is this? It's Jesus. Jesus is the one who has his throne established forever. He's going to be a descendant of David. So when this woman comes to Jesus telling him that his son of David, she actually knew more theology than many of the Jews back in the days of Jesus. She understood who the son of David is. He is the one. And she wanted him. Even though she is not part of the covenant people of God, she knew that she wanted to be part of whatever Jesus is all about. And she's directing herself at the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, in this world which we live in, there are many, many people who believe in different forms of Jesus. You see, I always tell people, we hang out the sign, says, you know, Hong Kong for Jesus. I, I, I really do believe that sometimes people are encouraged, but sometimes I wonder if they only believe in their own version of Jesus. I mean, I hope they don't, because that's a gateway for people to understand, hey, believe in Jesus Christ, but there's so many different forms of Jesus. People have a different understanding of Jesus all the time. And that's why the purpose, do you believe in Jesus of the Bible? You see, I get invited to all kinds of faith-based initiatives these days. I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor in the city. I'm a community worker in that way. So it's wonderful. People invite me to prayer breakfast, faith-based initiatives. When people come, Muslim clerics, Buddhist monks, if they come, Jewish rabbis, Catholic priests and pastors, Christian pastors, all come to one place and try to do something for the city. And sometimes there's kind of some kind of spirituality behind that. Right? They kind of insert some kind of spiritual environment. There's a prayer. And you pray. And somehow this God that you pray to is agreed by the Muslim. He's a God. By the Hindus, by the by the Catholic priests, by the Jehovah's Witnesses. By that that this is the, the God that we commonly preach to or commonly pray to. But the reality is that there's no such thing. We don't all believe in the same God. We believe in Jesus, not the Jesus of Muslims understanding, not even the Jesus of Catholic understanding, right? Not the Jesus that had to kowtow to Mother Mary. Not that kind of Jesus. Not the Jesus of Jehovah's Witnesses. Not the Jesus of the Muslims. Not the Jesus of the Jewish rabbi. We believe the Jesus of the New and the Old Testament, Jesus of the Bible. So therefore, even though I'm willing to go and partner with Catholics and Muslims and let's do something good for the city, I never ever mix spiritual state with them. We can't worship together. We can't pray together. We can't do any of these things together. We can work together and do something good. We can pass our food together, serve our community, but we can't participate in any kind of spiritual activity together because we don't worship the same God. And I can't let Jesus be placed upon on the shelf with any other gods because that would be dishonoring to our Lord Jesus Christ. It would be. There's actually a, a story in the Old Testament where they try doing this. There's a story of the Philistines. The Philistines captured the Ark of God. And God actually allowed the Ark to be captured. He said, you know, I allowed the Ark to be captured because he's trying to teach the Phil- uh, Philistines, also the Israelites, and that, that's a lesson. So he allowed the Ark to be captured, and the Philistines thought they did it, and it placed the Ark of Covenant in their temple. Temple Dagon of the god Dagon. So it placed next to the god Dagon in the morning. What happened to Dagon? Do you know that story? It was on the ground, right? Bound down before the ark. So what's going on here? 
So they put Dagon up again next to the shelf, on the shelf next to, again, the Ark of Covenant. And again, in the morning, Dagon was bowing down before the Ark of Covenant with his arms and legs broken. God says, you know what? I ain't going to be placed on the shelf with the rest of you all. It's not going to happen. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to who? No other, nor am I praised to carved idols. None. Jesus is not going to offer himself as one of the options. It's not going to happen. He's the only option. He's not going to be placed on a shelf with other gods. So therefore, when we are specific in our faith, a faith that pleases God, it must necessarily be specific toward the Jesus of the Bible, not just a general Jesus, not the Jesus of the Muslims, not the Jesus of the rabbis, not the Jesus of people's imagination, but the Jesus of the Bible. That's the faith that pleases God. So we see first two characteristics. The faith that pleases God first is a faith that clings to the mercy of God. And second, the faith that pleases God is a faith that's directed at the person of Jesus Christ. But that's not all. There's two more. You're going to see in this conversation, it only gets better from here. Conversation with the Canaanite woman. The third faith that pleases God, the third characteristic that is, the faith that pleases God is a faith that's persistently pleading before God. A faith that's persistent pleading before God, of a persistent pleading before God. We see this in verse 22 to 25. Verse 22 of Matthew chapter 15. It says, let's read this again. Behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon, but he did not answer a word. And disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she's crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 25, But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. Right? This woman just doesn't give up. <laughs> she does not give up. She's a persistent. So let's look at this story. So she's coming to Jesus. She's asking Jesus for mercy and grace. And she knew that Jesus can give it. She's looking at the person of Jesus. She's not looking at anyone else but the Lord Jesus Christ. And she's hitting some opposition. An opposition of what? Opposition of silence. It's a very, very interesting response that Jesus gives. She, he just didn't answer her word. Like in verse 23, right? but he did not answer her a word. Didn't tell her to go away. Didn't tell her to leave. Just didn't talk to her. And Jesus, by the way, doing this is teaching her, stretching her faith, and also teaching disciples a lesson. We're going to see why. All this is a lesson that Jesus has. I mean, Jesus knew what is in the heart of this Canaanite woman. And she's willing, he's willing to stretch her faith, to let her faith flourish so that her faith could be example to all. So he did not answer a word. Now, a Jewish rabbi not answering a Canaanite woman a word can be easily conceived as she's not worthy to talk to him. And this is exactly what the disciples were thinking. Verse 23, disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. You see, in the days of Jesus, there is an ethnocentric belief that the Jews are the chosen people of God and everyone else are dirty goyims, dirty Gentiles. Coming from Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 2, when God said, I chose Israel, I says, You are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his own possession of all the people who are on the face of the earth. So God has chosen the Jews. Not because the Jews were good people, but because of his love, like when, the way he chose you and me for salvation. Not because we're good, but just because he loved us. This is exactly what's taught in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7 through 8. It says, The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you are more in number than any of the people, but because you're the fewest of all, or rather because you're the fewest of all, but because the Lord loved you. Only because the Lord loved you that he chose you. And this is applying to the Israelites and applies to us today. We are chosen by God because we're loved, not because we have righteous deeds, not because we're good in our human nature, because God just simply chose to love you. And that's it. But the Jews didn't understand. They developed in some kind of religious tradition and rules and began to follow these things and start to separate themselves from the Gentile, thinking that, you know what, we're better than them because we have these rules and tradition and way of life and God certainly is more pleased with us. So the disciples come to Jesus and say, you know, Jesus, send her away. You're not talking to her. So they thought they knew what Jesus is thinking. They thought Jesus didn't want to talk to this woman. But Jesus had something else in mind. Jesus is going to stretch this woman's faith and teach the disciples. The disciples are trying to learn 
or trying to trying to and he's gonna teach disciples to figure teach disciples to disciples to figure this out. Disciples didn't understand it, don't have the comprehension. So you know what? Just that's what I would have done. Just drive her away. She's screaming at us. She's being annoying. So Jesus answered in such a way to challenge the disciples thinking. He kind of played the game a little bit here in verse 24. Verse 24, Jesus says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, you can't read tone in the Bible, so I don't know exactly what kind of tone Jesus used, but if you hear what Jesus says here, you'll question him immediately. If you thought about this, now the disciples didn't question him because they really think this too. Jesus, by this time, had helped plenty of people who are not part of the house of Israel. Okay, Matthew chapter 4, verse 24 and 25, he healed all kinds of people coming from Syria, Decapolis, which are region outside the nation of Israel. Healed them, healed them all. Was compassionate toward them. And also in Matthew chapter 8, there was a centurion, right? Remember when we talked about a centurion who was a Gentile, had a servant who was sick, and Jesus healed this person and said the centurion had faith as greater than many of the, those he met in the land of Israel. So Jesus, by this time, had helped plenty of people in the nation of Israel. By saying this, he's actually challenging what the disciples are thinking and saying, saying, you know what, you guys think that I'm only reaching out to the nation of Israel? You think that I'm only for the house of Israel? Think again. I'm going to be doing more than that. So the disciples obviously failed the test because they thought Israel is where it's all at. But God, Jesus, has something else planned in mind. The woman didn't face, fail the test. This woman actually kept asking Jesus for grace. We see this in verse 25. She comes to Jesus and said, Jesus, please help me. She was persistent. She knew that she needed God. She knew that if she was persistent in following what Jesus told people should follow, namely cry out to God for grace and mercy, cry out to him for grace and mercy, she will receive it. She was persistent. And even though God at the moment seemed to be silent, seemed to be withholding his blessing, seemed to be not answering her prayers, she knew that as long as she is willing to keep pursuing God, God will one day answer. God will be there for her. And such is the faith that you and I need to have. And such is the faith that God used, Jesus actually used to teach other people a lesson. It's a faith that's of commendation. It's a faith that's an example for us. See, you look at the trees, the, tr the way the trees are built. The more the tree is shaken by the wind, what happens is the root. The root grows stronger. That is the example for us, the illustration for us. And throughout all the New Testament and Old Testament, you see God continually pressing people so that they will be persistent in their faith to reach out to Him. And He actually withholds His blessing at times so that people will push forward and persist in seeking Him. Look at Martha and Mary. What happened? In that day where Lazarus was almost dying and almost dying and eventually died, they sent people to Jesus and said, Jesus, the one you love, is dying. Would you come and heal Lazarus? What did Jesus do? He waited there for what? Two more days. Two more days. Until when? Until Lazarus died. And Mary Martha was so disappointed, so sad by the fact that Jesus didn't come when they asked Jesus to. When Jesus finally came, he said, to Martha in John chapter 11, verse 25, 26. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe in this? Martha says, I believe. And Jesus says, watch. Walked up to the grave. Said, come out, Lazarus. And Lazarus came out. Raised from the dead. Wouldn't have happened if Jesus just came in the beginning, but he was withholding his blessing just for a moment so that our faith, so that our faith of Martha and Mary can be strengthened so all the people who watch this, their faith will grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see this throughout the whole Old Testament as well. You see, Jacob, Jacob had to wrestle with God. He didn't understand, right? He was a deceiver. He was a sinner. He was wrestling till daybreak. He had to get his sins out of him. He said, God, I want you. I know I can't live with you. You have these, these, these simple habits in me. I don't want the same. But you're wrestling with God. God, let me figure it out with you. Daybreak, God said, let me go. He says, no, I will not let you go until you bless me. God said, I will bless you. Wrestling with God. Trying to figure it out. And you and I, we also wrestle with God at times, right? Things we don't understand. 
God, why aren't you answering this prayer? Why aren't you leading me this way? Why, why is this thing happening? Why isn't that thing happening? God, I need to hold on to you even more so. I need to pursue you. I need to be persistent in my prayer even more so so I can understand exactly what you want from me and how I can do your will in this situation. I want you more than anything else. That's the persistent prayer of this Canaanite woman. It's a persistent prayer of Moses as well. Remember Moses was the well punished by God in some way, shape, and form, disciplined. Say, hey, I can't allow you to go to the promised land because you did not honor me in front of the eyes of the people. And Moses pleaded and pleaded before God until God finally said in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 26, no, I didn't let him go. He says, you know, I made up my mind. <laughs> Speak to me no more on this matter. Right? But Moses' faith was an example for us. And Moses literally was begging and begging and begging, saying, God, God, like, until you say no, I'm going to keep asking. Right? Until you say no, I'm going to keep asking. And that's how our faith is strengthened. That's how our faith is purified. First Peter chapter 1, verse 7 says, So the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's how faith is being tested. You have to care. You can't just live your life being nonchalant. If you live your life, you know what? I'm just going to be comfortable. I'm going to live a life that's expected. I'm going to die comfortably in my bed. You're not pursuing God. You're not seeking after God. You're not being persistently pleading before God for the next thing God wants you to do. Then your faith will not ever grow. It's just not going to grow. But God today is telling you a faith that pleases God is a faith that seeks after God. It doesn't mean you can control God by your faith. That's not the word. That's, that's what the word faith movement teaches us. No, your faith can't control God. God is still God. Like Moses, right? God didn't tell Moses, oh, just because you plead with me so much that you know, I'll give you whatever you want now. No. God still says, no. But Moses' faith was example. Example for us. So is this Canaanite woman's faith. You and I need to feel a deep-seated care and passion for the things of God. Enough, so much of it, that we cannot sleep until that thing is resolved in our minds. That's the passion, that's the pleading that this Canaanite woman is exhibiting. That's the faith that pleases God. So therefore we see three characteristics so far of a faith that pleases God. First characteristic is that the faith that pleases God is the one that clings to the mercy of God. Second, the faith that pleases God is a faith that is directed at the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And third, the faith that pleases God is a faith that's persistently pleading before God. Fourth one, the last one, is a faith that's bold before God. A faith that's bold before God. We'll see this in verse 26 to 28. Again, verse 26, continuing this conversation, very interesting conversation, Jesus answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall after or from their master's table. And Jesus answered her, Oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. Her daughter was healed instantly. So we're continuing this conversation. This woman coming to Jesus, she was persistent, pleading before God for the mercy and the grace of God. But Jesus had to stretch her faith a little bit because Jesus could read minds. She knew what this woman's about. She's serious. And she just wanted her faith to be example to disciples. Disciples actually needed to see this. So she tells the woman, very interesting statement. She says, oh, he says, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. I mean, the picture here is your children are eating at the table, and there's a dog underneath the table, right? There's a dog right here. We see it. It's, a, it's not just any kind of wild dog. There's a term for that. But the Greek word used here is a term used for a family pet, a small dog. It's not right for me to, even the children have, have children now, and sometimes they don't eat their food. It's not right for me to just kind of, because they don't eat that, and then give it to a dog. I should probably save it and put it in the fridge and, Make them eat it you know, later on. That's what I would do. So it's not right for me to throw the children away, the children of the Israelites. And again, this playing into the perception that the Jews are the only people of God. The woman had the answer. See, the woman was bold. She knew what the Old Testament says. She knew that the Jews in the Old Testament were chosen to be the covenant people of God. Yet she knew that God is more than that. 
throughout the Old Testament, God actually reached out to many people who are not Jews. There's Naaman the Syrian, who were one of the lepers in that region. He's not a Jew. Many lepers exist in the land of Israel, yet a non-Jew received the healing of God. There was a woman from Zarephath who was a Gentile woman, yet she was the only woman that was treated well by Elijah the prophet. And her life was saved by Elijah. So she knew that there are testaments in the Old Testament where people who are not part of the covenant people of God, people who are not part of the Jewish ethnicity that were treated well by God because of the faith in Yahweh. So she's clinging onto that promise. She knew, you know what, if I come to Jesus with the same kind of heart, attitude, I should receive grace, I should receive mercy. She had a response for Jesus in verse 27. A smart response. A bold response saying, you know what, if I reach out, if I just step out in faith, God will be there for me because she saw it all the time in the Old Testament stories. She says in verse 27, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat at the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Even the dog will eat of it. Say, you know what, I don't need the food they give to the children. Just give me something, throw me a bone. You know, so I was talking with some of our, uh, some of the American culture, like some of the Chinese, uh, some culture, we eat everything around the bone. You know, we eat the top portion, the bottom portion. But some people, when they eat the chicken bone, you just eat the middle portion, you throw away the top and the bottom, the, the, then the meat is still there, throw it to the dog, right? The dog will eat this. That's exactly what she's saying, just throw me anything. Just a bone. Anything, anything left over. That's good enough for me. She has such faith in the graciousness of God, saying, God, if you just drop a drop of water, that's enough to switch my thirst. Just give me something. Martin Luther, the reformer, actually says this, and says, and he, he quote, I quote him, says, she cleverest, cleverly ensnares Christ in his own words, in a good way. She is bold. She's going to tell Jesus, remind Jesus who God is. And that only if Jesus was willing to give her just a little bit, she's satisfied by it. To this, Jesus answered her again in verse, I believe in verse 28. Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Jesus answered her, great is your faith. Maga, omega is the word. Mega is your faith. Great is your faith. Of all the people that Jesus talked to in the land of Jewish region, she has complimented people's faith. Oh, he has complimented people's faith. And he has also, well, rebuked people's faith or the lack of it. Remember, there are people who have been said to have great faith in the New Testament. The woman here, one example, you know where the other example is? Great is such faith I have not seen all of Israel. Centurion, another Gentile. Two incidences where Jesus proclaimed someone who had great faith is to Gentiles. And there are two incidences where Jesus said, you who, have, you who are of little faith is to who? To the disciples. Right? Disciples have little faith, both on the Sea of Galilee. Why are you so afraid, you little faith? And to Peter. Why are you looking at the wind and the waves? Why not looking at me? Why don't you look at the Savior, you of little faith? So Jesus, by this comparison, is teaching the disciples, saying, hey, the woman here has greater faith than you. You need to learn from him. Excuse me, you need to learn from her. You need to learn from her faith. And disciples finally did. They begin to learn to push forward because they need to learn that God is not just the God of the Jews. But God is a God of the Gentiles as well. Eventually, all the disciples spent their lives reaching to the Gentiles. Did you know that? At the end of their life, they all died while, for, while reaching Gentiles in foreign lands. They learned this lesson. They learned to follow Jesus. They learned what does it mean in Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They learned to step out of the expectation of the Jewish boundary 
expectation of their own culture, expectation of what is expected of them or what they should be doing and to do whatever it is that God would want them to do. They know that God is of grace and mercy and that grace and mercy should be shown to all people, not just the Jews. You see, God is also calling us to have such bold faith. Disciples need to learn to have boldness because they're, the boldness of their faith is what made their faith great. The boldness of this woman's faith is what made her faith great. And the boldness of our faith today is what makes our faith great. Were you willing, are you willing to step out in faith for God even though some of the stigma of our culture tells you not to? Maybe it's hard for you to share the gospel. Maybe it's hard for you to tell people about Jesus Christ because you're just too embarrassed to do it in your own setting, your own workplace. You know, there's a woman, we read about her in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 8 actually, who is a woman that shouldn't be stepping out of her room. She's a woman with a blood loss. Everything she touches, according to Jewish custom and Levitical law, is unclean. The chair she sits on, the bed that she sleeps on, everything, okay, is unclean. She shouldn't even be leaving her home. But you know what? She didn't care. She didn't care. She said, well, I'm going to step out anyways. Jesus is in town. I'm going to reach out to him. I'm going to, I'm going to go to him. I know that if I go to him, a crowd to him for grace and mercy, he's going to do something about my situation. I'm not going to take no for an answer. I'm going to reach out. And you know what? She was healed. She was bold. She's willing to do something that no one else has done before. That's the faith that God asks us to have. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says, Ask, and you'll be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and you'll be open to you. Everyone who asks, receive. To the one who seeks, find. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. God didn't tell you how long you have to knock. God didn't tell you how long you have to seek. Again, there's a persistent aspect to this kind of faith. But it's a continual knocking. It's a continual seeking. It's a continual seek, continual asking. It's a continual reaching out to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus himself actually gave a parable about this in Luke, saying that there is a friend came into town to a person in the middle of the night. This person didn't have anything to feed this friend. So he goes to the neighbor's house and knocks on the door in the middle of the night and says, please, please open the door, give me something so I can feed my friend. The neighbor says, you know, it's the middle of the night. It's too late. The friend wouldn't stop knocking, right? Or the person, the neighbor would, uh, the, the, the person wouldn't stop knocking, kept knocking on the neighbor's door. The neighbor finally got up and said, you know what, I'll give you whatever you need. And Jesus says, this is the way you ought to pray. With such boldness, asking God for whatever it is that you want God to give to you, the things that are of the kingdom of God. So I ask you a question today. Are you pleading before God in such a way? Are you having this compassion before God? Do you have this compassion before God? Do you have this passion, rather, before God in which you would seek out whatever it is that God would have for you? Or are you comfortable in your own lives? And just thinking, you know, if I just have a comfortable bed to sleep on, if I just kind of live my life bathing in the sun, collecting seashells, retirement life, and that will be, be the life I look forward to. Or you continue pushing forward to seek for what is the next cutting edge thing that God will want you to do for your life. See, that's the heart that God wants us to have. He wants us to continue approach to Him, approach Him with confidence. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of God so that we may receive mercy and grace and help in time of need. We'll always come to God. God, what is it you have for me? How can I use my job? How can I use my family time? How can I use my particular scenario for your glory. I want it to be more about just my own ambition. I want it to be about you. I want you to see I want to see more of your working in my life. I want to see you use me for your purposes. See, this is not just about pastors. It's about each one of us. Luther always says, you know, there's nothing between sake difference between sacred and secular. It's all sacred. All work for God is sacred work. You need and I need to recognize that everything we need, we are doing is for the glory of God. We need to continue to press before God and say, God, what would you have for me? Now, it doesn't mean that God will immediately give it to you. Sometimes the moment of waiting. See, you, your passion oftentimes is there first before God actually brings something to you. That opportunity that is. Did you know that? Your passion is there first. Then God, maybe years later, will provide opportunity and will open up the door for you. Sometimes maybe because the person you need is not there, the opportunity is not there, the circumstances are not all 
together yet. But the passion in your heart is there. And for me, I was a, uh, I had dreamed of becoming a pastor, a missionary for a long, long time. Ever since I was a teenager, I wanted to do this. Okay, I had to work in the secular field for 14 years before I came over here and became your pastor. I mean, literally, the church was in a position where the, a new chapter was being stepped into, and I was in a position where I was stepping into a new chapter in my life, and God just matched it. You see? Sometimes that desire is there first before the opportunity is there, but you are constantly pleading before God, God, when is it that you're going to give this to me? When is it? And God didn't say no. God just, you know what? He's just silent. Say, hey, stretch it. Stretch your faith. And throughout the 14 years of my life, I can recognize my faith was stretched. I was growing in the Lord. What's prepared for me for ministry is because of this 14 years of my life where God didn't give it to me. But that's what happens to each one of us today. God didn't give you what you want. You want something. God, you know, when is this going to come? But that moment of silence is when God's stretching your face. Hey, you're not ready for this yet. But I want you to be ready. So when I give it to you, you'll glorify me with it and not just fall off the edge. Right? You don't want to be a celebrity and all of a sudden you have all this money, all this fame, you just fall off the edge. No, you want to be stretched that you be ready for that moment where God calls you to glorify him in that new role that you're in. So this is our God. Our God stretches us. He wants us the faith that pleases Him. Faith that pleases Him is this. We saw four characteristics. A faith that pleases God clings to the mercy of God. The faith that pleases God, what? It's directed at the person of Jesus Christ. A faith that pleases God is consistently pleading before God. And last, the faith that pleases God is a faith that's bold before God. Want to step out in faith for God. God will answer your prayer and our prayers, our prayers, and his timing. To draw to a close, I want to share with you a story of George Mueller. And George Mueller was a, a tremendous example to the Christian world because of his faith and because of his attitude of prayer before the Lord. He had orphanages he built and was praying for food to be provided, and God just provides and provides because George Mueller prays for it. But there's a story where George Mueller was praying for five men, five men to be saved. These five men were the men that he has determined that he will pray for them every day without fail. So his autobiography, he said he prayed for these men through sickness and health, on land or on sea, through heavy engagement or ministry, of, in, of ministry or not, like through difficult times, through business, busyness or through just regular life. George Mueller was praying for these five men. He's praying for them since the, no, uh, the month of November, 1844. So what happens, the 18 months went by. The first person got saved. And then five years went by, the second person came to know the Lord. Then six years went by, the third person came to know Jesus. But then that was it for a while. And George Miller died. In his autobiography, he said, I hope in God I prayed on and looked for an answer. They're not converted yet, but they will be. And guess what? In 18, 1897, 52 years later, after George Mueller began to pray for these five men, these two men came to the Lord, know the Lord Jesus Christ. They got saved. George Mueller prayed and prayed, even though he didn't see the fruition of his labor, yet God was faithful in answering his prayer. So I ask you and ask myself, what are we praying for today? Do we have this consistent prayer before God? Do we have this consistent pleading before God? Are we reaching out to God? Are we, have we given up? Have we given up, have we given up our family members? Have we given up our, our friends? Or are we still having this dream in our heart, God, you could do something with my life. I'm not going to take no for an answer. I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep seeking until you say no or if you direct me a different direction. But until then, I'm going to keep pressing forward after you because that's what this woman did. She did. She was greatly rewarded. Amen? Let's pray. Our Father, we again thank you for this passage and we wanted to be like this woman and yet we know, Lord, that the reason why this woman is the way she is is because she kept her eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Her faith was bold. Unlike Peter who took his eyes off the Lord Jesus at the moment where he was on the waves and the, on the sea, this woman never took her eyes off Jesus and she held on to him throughout the time even though it seemed like Jesus was silent. 
But God, we may face, may we face the same, may we have the same kind of attitude toward you, God. Even though at times you appear to be silent in our lives, at times where you appear to not answer our prayers, and times where our lives seem to be stagnant, that we would never ever take no for an answer. We keep reaching out until you give us an answer, like Moses, like Jacob. Lord, give us courage, God, to have this heart before you. We thank you again.